soothing story time. In Kropfsburg Keep To the traveller from Innsbruck to Munich Up the lovely valley of the Silver Inn Many castles appear One after another Each on its beetling cliff Or gentle hill appear and disappear, melting into the dark fir trees that grow so thickly on every side, Lanek, Lichua, Ratholtz, Tratzberg, Madsen, Kropfsberg, gathering close around the entrance to the dark and wonderful Celerithel. But to us, Tom Rendell and myself, there are two castles only, not the gorgeous and princely Ambras, nor the noble old Tratzberg with its crowded treasures of solemn and splendid medievalism. But little Madsen, where eager hospitality forms the new life of a near-dead chivalry, and Kropfsberg, ruined, tottering, blasted by fire and smitten with grievous years, a dead thing and haunted, full of strange legends and eloquent of mystery and tragedy. We were visiting the Von Seas at Madston and gaining our first wandering knowledge of the courtly, cordial castle life in the Tyrol, of the gentle and delicate hospitality of noble Austrians. Brick's leg had ceased to be but a mark on a map and had become a place of rest and delight, a home for homeless wanderers on the face of Europe. Washloss Matson was a synonym for all that was gracious and kindly and beautiful in life. The days moved on in a golden round of riding and driving and shooting down to Landl and Dearcy for Shamwas across the river to the magic Ashenseg up the Selethra across the Schmermana Josh even to the railway station at Steinach, and in the evenings, after the late dinners in the upper hall, where the sleepy hounds leaned against our chairs, looking at us with suppliant eyes, in the evenings when the fire was dying away, in the hooded fireplace in the library, Stories, stories and legends and fairy tales, while the stiff old portraits changed countenance constantly under the flickering firelight, and the sound of the drifting in 
came softly across the meadows far below. If ever I tell the story of Schloss Madsen, there will be the time to paint the too inadequate picture of this fair oasis in the desert of travel and tourists and hotels. But just now, it is Crofsburg, the silent, that is of greater importance, for it was only in Madston that the story was told by Freudian E, the gold-haired niece of Frau von Sees, one hot evening in July, when we were sitting in the great west window of the drawing room after a long ride up the southern thou. All the windows were open to catch the faint wind, and we had sat for a long time watching the Otzenthaler Alps turn rose colour over distant Innsbruck then deeper to violet as the sun went down and the white mists rose slowly until Lichwa and Lanark and Croftsburg rose like craggy islands in a silver sea. And this is the story as Fräulein E told it to us, the story of Scroftsburg Keep. A great many years ago, soon after my grandfather died, and Madston came to us, when I was a little girl, and so young that I remember nothing of the affair except as something dreadful that frightened me very much. Two young men who had studied painting with my grandfather came down to Briggsleg from Munich, partly to paint and partly to amuse themselves, ghost hunting, as they said for they were very sensible young men, and prided themselves on it, laughing at all kinds of superstition, and particularly at that form which believed in ghosts, and feared them. They had never seen a real ghost, you know, and they belonged to a certain set of people who believed nothing they had not seen themselves, which always seemed to me very conceited. Well, they knew that we had lots of beautiful castles here, in the lower valley, and they assumed, and rightly, that every castle has at least one ghost story connected with it. So they chose this as their hunting ground, only the game they sought was ghosts, not chamois. Their plan was to visit every place that was supposed to be haunted, and to meet every reputed ghost and prove that it really was no ghost at all. There was a little inn down in the village then, kept by an old man named Peter Roskopf, and the two young men made this their headquarters. The very first night they began to draw from the old innkeeper all that he knew of legends and ghost stories connected with Briggsleg and its castles, 
and as he was a most garrulous old gentleman, he filled them with the wildest delight by his stories of the ghosts of the castles about the mouth of the Zillowfell. Of course the old man believed every word he said, and you can imagine his horror and amazement when, after telling his guest the particularly blood-curdling story of Scropsburg and its haunted keep, the elder of the two boys, whose surname I have forgotten, but whose Christian name was Rupert, calmly said, your story is most satisfactory. We will sleep in Croftsburg Keep tomorrow night, and you must provide us with all that we may need to make ourselves comfortable. The old man nearly fell into the fire. What for a blockhead are you? he cried with big eyes. The keep is haunted by Count Albert's ghost, I tell you. That is why we are going there tomorrow night. We wish to make the acquaintance of Count Albert. But there was a man staying there once, and in the morning he was dead. Very silly of him. There are two of us and we carry revolvers. But it is a ghost, I tell you, almost screamed the innkeeper, our ghosts afraid of firearms. Whether they are or not, we are not afraid of them. Here the younger boy broke in. He was named Otto von Kleist, I remember the name for I had a music teacher once by that name. He abused the poor old man shamefully, told him that they were going to spend the night in Kropfsberg in spite of Count Albert and Peter Roscroft, and that he might as well make the most of it and earn his money with cheerfulness. In a word, they finally bullied the old fellow into submission, and when the morning came, he set about preparing for the suicide, as he considered it, with sighs and mutterings and ominous shakings of the head. You know the condition of the castle now. Nothing but scorched walls and crumbling piles of fallen masonry. Well, at that time, I tell you of, the keep was still partially preserved. It was finally burned out only a few years ago by some wicked boys who came over from Genbach to have a good time. But when the ghost hunters came, though the two lower floors had fallen into the crypt, the third floor remained. The peasants said it could not fall, but that it would stay until the day of judgment, because it was in the room above that the wicked Count Albert sat watching the flames destroy the great castle and his imprisoned guests, and when he finally hung himself in a suit of armour that belonged to his medieval ancestor, the first Count Croftsberg. No one dared touch him, and so he hung there for twelve years. And all the time, venturesome boys and daring men used to creep up the turret steps and stare, awfully 
through the chinks in the door at that ghostly mass of steel that held within itself the body of a murderer and suicide slowly returning to the dust from which it was made. Finally, it disappeared, none knew whither. And for another dozen years the room stood empty, but for the old furniture and the rotted hangings. So when the two men climbed the stairway to the haunted room, they found a very different state of things from what exists now. The room was absolutely as it was left the night Count Albert burned the castle, except that all trace of the suspended suit of armour and its ghastly contents had vanished. No one had dared to crush the threshold, and I suppose that for forty years no living thing had entered that dreadful room. On one side stood a vast canopied bed of black wood, the damask hangings of which were covered with mould and mildew. All the clothing of the bed was in perfect order, and on it lay a book, open and face downward, the only other furniture in the room consisted of several old chairs, a carved oak chest, and a big inlaid table covered with books and papers, and on one corner two or three bottles with dark, solid sediment at the bottom, and a glass, also dark, with the dregs of wine that had been poured out almost half a century before. The tapestry on the walls was green with mould, but hardly torn or otherwise defaced. For although the heavy dust of forty years lay on everything, the room had been preserved from further harm. No spider web was to be seen. No trace of nibbling mice. Not even a dead moth or fly on the sills of the diamond-paned windows. Life seemed to have shunned the room utterly and finally. The men looked at the room curiously and, I am sure, not without some feelings of awe and unacknowledged fear. But whatever they may have felt, of instinctive shrinking, they said nothing, and quickly set to work to make the room passably inhabitable. They decided to touch nothing that had not absolutely to be changed, and therefore they made for themselves a bed in one corner with the mattress and linen from the inn. In the great fireplace they piled with lots of wood on the caked ashes of a fire, dead for forty years, turned the old chest into a table, and laid out on it all their arrangements for the evening's amusement. Food? 
two or three bottles of wine, pipes and tobacco, and the cheese board that was their inseparable travelling companion. All this they did themselves. The innkeeper would not even come within the walls of the outer court. He insisted that he had washed his hands of the whole affair. The silly dunderheads might go to their deaths their own way. He would not aid and abet them. One of the stable boys brought the basket of food and the wood. On the bed up the winding stone stairs, to be sure. But neither money nor prayers nor threats would bring him within the walls of the accursed place, and he stared fearfully at the hare-brained boys as they worked around the dead old room, preparing for the night that was coming so fast. At length everything was in readiness and after the final visit to the inn for dinner, Rupert and Otto started at sunset for the keep. Half the village went with them, for Peter Roscopf had babbled the whole story to an open-mouthed crowd of wandering men and women, and as to an execution the awestruck crowd followed the two boys dumbly, curious to see if they surely would put their plan into execution. End of 